Hello and welcome to the two man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest, former USWA world champion, former CWA tag team champion. He is, of course, known as Mantar or Tank. He is Mike Halley. Mike, welcome to the two man power trip. How are you doing? Hey, good evening, John. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and on your show, the two man power trip. I've been waiting a long time for this day, brother. I'm glad it finally came. Oh, yeah. So what's going on in your world? What have you been up to? Man, I'm just uh, living a good life here in Florida. Um, 85 degrees today, man. They said the weather this time this year at this point has never been better in the last 20 years. So we're definitely soaking up the sun, soaking up the palm trees. And I'm just, you know, hit, starting to hit the beach. They just opened up the beach uh, the other day. So going to be going there this weekend, man. So I'm excited, man. I'm down here living my best life, bro. Nice. That's awesome. That is great. And you mentioned before, I don't know if I should mention this on air, but you mentioned certain things, you know, in pain. Obviously, that's what happens in, in wrestling, taking all those bumps. So how are you feeling physically? You know what? Physically, um, I can't really complain. I mean, I could complain, but who the fuck's going to listen, right? Right. Um, I, got a, I got a plate in my back. I got a plate in my neck. I've had surgery on both wrists. I've had surgery on both elbows. You know, I'm pretty, I'll be 55 in a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, if I would have known way back when what I know now, I would have done things a little bit differently. You know what I mean? Yep. Oh, yeah, for sure. When you look at that and, and you're looking at, you know, maybe taking pills and stuff, was that something that most guys did? Very common. You just take pills. You're in so much pain, things like that. Oh, yeah. A lot of guys took uh, oxycodones. You know, they took somas. They took Valiums. You know, um, some guys, you know, smoked weed, some guys did cocaine, so a lot of guys drank beer. You know, I was never really a big beer drinker, so I never drank too much. And I wasn't really a pill guy, even though uh, a bunch of clowns decided they wanted to slip me about 10 or 15 Mickeys in the Denver fucking airport. Uh, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> So what is that story? Because I, I know that that's kind of been out there, been said before, like, oh, uh, uh, you know, it was either X-Pac or somebody had kind of slipped you something. And I know Duke Drosy kind of said something different. So what what is that story? Like, what happened? Well, so I think there was um, myself, um, Adam Bond, the one, two, three kid. Um, I think the dumpster was there. Um, I think Shawn Michaels might have been there. There was six or eight of us just hanging out at the airport in Denver because we all came from LA. We were just we were on an LA trip for like 30 days, right? So we were all flying back home for a day or two before we had to be back on TV. And so we our plane was awake because there was a fucking huge snowstorm outside. And so we're drinking, sitting at the airport drinking, man, and. Um, Taking pills, you know, at that time, fuck, I probably took five or six pills of my own. You know, I probably took a couple of painkillers, a couple of volumes. I can't remember exactly, but I know that I was taking some myself willingly. And then um, I made the uh, green horn rookie mistake of leaving my beer on the table when I went to take a piss. And, you know, I. I never would have thought that these guys would have took a shot at me like that, right? Because um, they could have fucking killed me, to be honest with you. I mean, Adam Baum was really concerned. He was like, Horn, he was like, I want you to call me, bro, as soon as you get home. And then he says, I want you to call me when you wake up. And I was like, okay, and this was like, I don't know, 11 o'clock in the morning, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And we'd been drinking and stuff. So I get on the airplane back to Nebraska. And I have a couple of fucking beers on the airplane, man. And um, I get back to Nebraska, and I am fucking wired to the gills, man. I'm going 300 miles an hour, and I don't know why. And, you know, sometimes when you pill somebody, it has an opposite effect on them, right? Because it should have fucking knocked me out, man. I should have been fucking sleeping. And um, for a long last time, right, for 12, 13 hours. And, uh, but I wasn't, man. I, I ended up getting home. I was up all fucking night. And I remember calling Adam Bob about 10 o'clock the following morning. He was like, Lord, you made it. He was like, man, he says, you're a fucking elephant, bro. He says, these guys would have had to fucking harpoon your ass to put you down, man. He says, you were standing tall. 
I said, bro, you want to hear something funny? I says, when I got up and left the table, I went to catch my plane. I says, I'm walking down the fucking jetway, and walking towards me is uh, Jerry Bristol, Pat Patterson, and Vince McMahon. And I'm like, I know that I'm fucked up, right? I mean, I could feel it, man. And I, I don't know if I was weaving back and forth or not, but, you know, Vince said, hey, Mike, how you doing? I was like, good, Vince, you? And I said, hello to Pat and Jerry, and, uh, and I just kept right on boogieing, man. And I'm like, these guys had to know that I was fucked up, right? And so I called Brian, and he was like, man, he says, what time did you get to bed, man? He says, you sleep on the plane? I said, sleep on the fucking plane? I says, you're funny, bro. He says, I've been up all fucking night. I haven't been to sleep yet. He was like, what? He was like, oh, my God. He says, you really are a fucking elephant, man. He says, the fuckers are going to have to harpoon your ass next time to put you down. He says, he says they must have put 20 fucking pills in your drink. Holy shit. He says, he says, I was so worried about you, man. He says, that's why I said, man, call me when you get back to the bar. Say, call me when you. When you uh, get up in the morning, man, just make sure you fucking wake up, right? And um, it was it was unbelievable, man. But no, they couldn't knock the fucking mantar down, buddy. I'm half man, half fucking beast, and hundred percent man, buddy. I'm four hundred pounds of fucking man. You only got to take more than a few pills and knock me down. Yeah, oh shit! But that that is dangerous, though. Playing, you know, playing those type of games. Real you know, dangerous, like, man. That's that's rushing the lead, basically. You know, because. A lot of guys, man, have died of overdoses, right? Kurt Henning, Rick Rude, Eddie Guerrero, a lot of fucking guys, right? A lot of guys. And, um, you know, the fans just might not know it, but the fucking boys know what's going on, right? The boys know who's dying or what, you know? But I can't tell you how many wrestlers have died from a fucking pill overdose, man. Fucking crazy. And to think that these motherfuckers... Um, trying to fucking do that shit to me, man, really pisses me off. And they're fucking good damn lucky that I never had to work with any of them, right? I mean, I worked with Duke, and I worked with Adam Bomb, and we always had great matches, man. There was no heat there. But as far as that motherfucking pricks, man, no, I, I don't, that shit don't fly. Did you ever say anything to him? Like, what, like, what the fuck, guys, you know? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm the type of person that, uh, you know, you fuck me once, fuck me, you fuck me twice, fuck you. And um, I figured if it came down to it in the ring when we were wrestling, man, that I would I would cash in my receipt, right? Because I definitely had a big fucking receipt to, to cash in. And But they're lucky that I never got to wrestle any of them, man. Crazy, crazy uh, <laughs> the times back then. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, man. Drugs were fucking rapid. I mean, Racer was in and out of fucking treatment. seemed like every other fucking month. You know, and they kept giving it a push and a push and a push. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? You know, I almost knocked the shit out of this fucking mouth in the ring when we had a match. Fucking prick. Now, you mentioned being half man, half beast, and obviously uh, that was the gimmick, but how'd you get into the WWF? Well, we'll, we'll kind of start there with, with the, the run there, since we're on the WWF time period right now. Like, how, how does that character come about? How do they find you? How do they get you? So, um, I started wrestling in the CWA over in Europe in 91, 92. And I wrestled over there every year. And I was over there, oh, I would say the winter of 95. And Ted DiBiase just came off TV after the one, two, three kid beat him on Monday Night Raw. So that was when his release was up. So he came over to Europe and wrestled a championship over there. And both Ted and I are originally from Omaha, Nebraska. We are both SOB, South Omaha boys. And um, so I looked after Teddy when he was he came over to Austria, over to Vienna. And he was there for like five or six days. And I took really good care of him. He said, listen, man, he says, you're a big dude. He said, you fly around, man. You're very light on your feet. He said, I love your work. He said, I'm sure Vince will love you. He said, uh, give me a call two weeks before you're leaving here on your way home. And he says, and I'll give Vince a call and, and he'll have a look at you. I'm like, okay. And so I, I called him. So like two and a half months went by, two, three months went by. So I finished the tour. A couple weeks before the end, I called Teddy up. I said, Teddy. I'll be home a week before Christmas. He was like, okay, great. I'll let Vince know. And so literally I got the letter 
on the 26th of December with that X letter to fly out on the 27th. Excuse me. And um, the rest is history. They brought me up to New York, picked me up in a limousine, drove me up to Connecticut. And, um, you know, they said that they would have creative come up with some stuff. And creative came up with like three or four ideas. And they kind of like this one. And I really didn't like any of the ideas, right? But who am I to say, hey, man, this is fucking shit, right? And um, I'm the type of person that I like to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. And so I feel that, you know, I've done that, you know, 30 years later, people are still talking about Mantar. And, um, you know, I must have done something right, whether they remember the fucking big bullhead that Vince paid $100,000 for it, I only, or half a dozen times, or whether they remember me belly to belly sequencing guys in the next week. Um, right out of the textbook. Um, so no matter what they remember, man, they still remember Mantar. And, um, so I'm pretty proud of that. That bullhead cost $100,000, really? Yeah, man. Vince flew me in Chicago like four times at the girls design shit. And he flew me in New York like three or four times. And I was remember I was in one of them high rises on like the 75th floor and in some fucking sweatshop. Um, where they were making all these designs and they were designing this fucking bullhead. And so they got it designed and the drawings that they had looked menacing, right? But the finished product looked like fucking Bessie the Cow. And they were like, well, we got to go with it. And, and so I was like, well, okay, you know, whatever. And um, so I designed it to fit like shoulder pads or on my shoulders and I would strap it down so the fucker wouldn't go to work because it was probably 40 pounds or more, right? I mean, it wasn't a fucking light thing. It had all that fur on it and fucking thing was like two foot taller than me, right? It was fucking huge. And um, I'm talking through the mouth and I remember doing the first TV shot. I forget where we were and I was right in the gorilla position and this big man said, is anybody... Uh, got you got Mikey in the ring yet with this fucking bullhead on? He says, This fucking thing is massive. And they was like, No, Vans, no Vans, no Vans, no Vans. He was like, Fuck. He was like, I'm telling you, he says, We gotta scratch this shit. And I remember I grabbed him fucking around his triceps and biceps and I shook him and I told him to him through the mouth and said, Vince, I got this. He says, Don't you worry, I got this. And he was like, Okay, kid, you say so. I said, good luck, and I went out there, climbed up the fucking, he's like, what's your plan? I was like, I'm going to climb up the corner, and I climb right back down on the inside. So when you actually see it, you know, it probably took me a little while to get up, climb up the fucking corner and climb down on the inside. And so they, they showed me taking like two steps up, and then they cut it to where I was taking the last step down on television, right? Um... But yeah, it made it look it made it look realistic and it worked out great and I didn't trip and fall and you know, all was good. That is so crazy though. Like he's willing to spend that much money on like this character. Like what did you think about that? Like wow, he's he's gonna go all the way with it, he's gonna go further with this. Like what did you think about that? Yeah, you know, I, mean, um, I mean that's personally I don't know if gangster character that I did over in Europe, right? I was a big fucking gangster. I had a tearaway suit and a felt for door. I had a, sometimes I carried a briefcase and I loaded before I hit guys over the fucking head with it. I would hit it on the canvas, load that fucker up and fucking bash him in the head. Or I would have a, a walking stick that I would use. And um, I really loved that character. And, you know, this was before Mr. Hughes. And so I would have been the first Mr. Hughes, but they, you know, they wanted to do this half man, half beast. They were in that gimmick mode at that era, at that time frame, right? And so they were trying to create fucking, I don't know, characters. And they was like, we're going to say you're from the Isle of Crete and we'll base your character off the uh, Minotaur. And I was like, okay, man, whatever you say. And then one day after I wore the fucking bullhead for five or six times, I showed the television and they said, well, we want to change up the gimmick. I was like, well, fuck it. Thank God for that, man. I'm tired of wearing that fucking bullhead. 
And so they would want to cut your hair into horns and put makeup on your face. And I was like, okay. So uh, Jerry K. Waller got his clippers out. We went to the locker room. We shaved the fucking horns on them. And it took me probably about two weeks to reshape them to where they were absolutely perfect because I'm totally anal about shit like that. You know, I'm not going to go out there with one horn up here and one horn down here. You know what I mean? It's just something stupid. And so but it took me you know, a week or two to kind of trim it up and get them to where they were perfect. But once I got them, man, I just shaved them every fucking day. And that's how I, I walked around with fucking horns on my head for a year. <laughs> when you initially got pitched that gimmick, I know you're saying like, okay, you know, you'll do whatever, but who is doing the, the pitching? Is it Bruce Pritchard and Vince? They sit you down? Like, how does that yeah, happen? It was, it was, um, it was Bruce Pritchard and Vince. I mean, I remember when I first met Vince, um, I met with uh, JJ Dillon and Vince. Uh, but when it came time to talk about the character, um, because they flew me up like, um, I don't know, maybe a week later, they, you know, we signed a contract and then I, I went home and they threw me back up and that's when I met with the creative people and, and sat down with Pritchard. They already had some drawings, you know, they took some pictures of me when I was up there. And, um, so when I came back a week later, they already had, you know, different shit, you know, drawn and, and things like that. So, um, that's when Pritchard and Ben sat me down and said, this is the you know, we want to go at. What did they say to you, like, hey, we see, because, you know, like, they say, like, um, uh, Dirty White Boy, like, oh, well, you were a plumber, you look like a plumber, like, you're going to be a plumber. Like, what did they say to you? You look like an animal. We're going to make you an animal. You know what I mean? Like, how's yeah, the pitch go? I mean, you know, they were like, Mikey's, they says, you know, you got one set of fucking massive thighs on you. You know, you're wearing a size 16 fucking shoe. You know, you're going to have fucking thighs like a bullwig, man. And they said, so we want to make you half man, half bull. And call you Mantar, and based off the myth of the Greek mythological character, the Minotaur. He says, uh, bottom half will be the man, and the top half will be the fucking bull. And I was like, okay, man. And so they didn't, they didn't say, we want you to do this specific thing. You know, so when I would put my head down and charge them, or I would do the Mantar shuffle, where I would shuffle my feet and my arms, like a train, kind of. You know, that's all shit that I just came up with on my own. You know, they, they didn't tell me specifically what they wanted to do. I remember one time when I did a finish, I came back to the locker room and they were like, we want you to do these two finishes back to back. So I go back out there and do these two finishes. And one of them was just fucking front slam on a guy, standing up, doing the fucking big wheel and just falling on him like a sack of shit, right? That was Chief J. Strongbow's idea. I was like, man, please don't make me fucking do that shit, man. So, you know, yeah, it's maybe, terrible. Oh, it's fucking rotten, man. And so finally, I just did it to where I caught the guy in a, in a crossbody and just fucking jumped up and fucking backed up a couple of steps, come off the ropes and fucking buried him, right? So, but, it's, but, you know, like, but, did Strombo doing that to rib you or was he dead serious? No, he was dead serious, man. He was serious as a fucking heart attack. Wow. And I, said, I was like, Chief, I said, you really want me to do this? He's like, yeah, I'm in the 400 pounds. He says, make that big fucking call and you just fall on him like a sack of potatoes. I was like, you mean like a sack of shit, Chief? Come on. You know, so I, but I went out there and did it out of respect for him. Luckily, they didn't have me do it. Um, but yeah, they made me go out there Three different times, I think, in one match, and do three different finishes. Simple. Testing stuff out, seeing what works, what doesn't work, but obviously you knew mm -hmm. the, the sack of shit thing is not going to work. Yeah, yeah, it just wasn't, wasn't feeling it, right? So when, like, you're coming along and you're doing this character, who is the person, like, uh, in creative at this point? Is it Bruce or is it more Vince? No, it was it was Bruce, and of course Vince always has his saying something, right? So, uh, Bruce was the number one guy, and then he ran everything through fucking Vince. So, you know, it was Bruce's idea, and you know, Bruce was a backstabber prick. You know, he acted like he fucking acted like he liked boots my face, but he really didn't. Right? For some reason, something rubbed him wrong. I don't know. So you didn't get along with Bruce at all. 
Oh, uh, not really, man. I used to drive up and down the fucking road with uh, Tom, you know, Doc Pitcher, and, you know, we used to smoke a lot of fucking weed, and maybe that's why he didn't like me, right? Because he knew that if I was right with his brother, and I was smoking weed, and, you know, they were, it was illegal until they were tested, yeah? And, you know, so, yeah, Bruce Pitcher was a fucking prick. What was it about Bruce that, like, he was saying to your face that he wasn't saying behind your back or, you know, vice versa, but what was he doing? What was he saying? Well, you know, when it came down to it, I remember, so fast forward a couple, two, three years, and Bret Hart brings me back to um, do the truth commission gimmick, right? And so he called me up. I was wrestling in Germany. He called me up and he said, Mike, he's like, I want you to be a part of this uh, six man tag. He says, I've got two greenhorns uh, and yourself. And he says, and I've got a, a guy that does the um, Kellogg's commercials in South Africa. And he says, he's going to be the mouthpiece. He's gonna, we're going to make him the commandant. You guys are going to be the soldiers. And you've already been on TV, so we're going to put a mask on you. I was like, do you think that's really going to matter? Brett, he's like, listen, this is just how we, how we drew it up. I said, okay. So they put a mask on me and said, we want you to train these guys. We're going to send you to Memphis for six months or so. And you guys get to give it down, and then we'll call you up, and, and we'll go with it. I was like, okay, Brett. So I went back and spent, I don't know, six, seven, eight months in fucking Memphis. Almost broke my neck, Russell, Jerry Lowe, and Louisville, Kentucky. The Louisville Gardens in front of like 12,000 fucking people on a Tuesday. And um, took a couple months off, and I probably I came back maybe a month early. I probably should have took that extra month off, you know, in hindsight. But I came back a month early, and, um, you know, we did, like, three televisions, and the fourth television was in Des Moines, Iowa, in my hometown, uh, like, two hours away from me. And I had been, you know, off for a week. And so um, I go up there, and as soon as I walk in the door, who says, you know, we want to piss test you. I was like, okay, piss test me. And, you know, and I know I'm clean. And um, so I piss test him, and I'm walking, I think I'm walking to catering. And he's like, hey, Mike, Bruce, this is Bruce Pritchard. I'm like, hey, Mike, let me talk to you. So it was Bruce. I said, yeah, what's up, Bruce? He said, hey, man. He said, I just want to tell you, man, that you failed your piss test, and we're going to have to let you go. I was like, what? I was like, I ain't no fucking piss test. I ain't smoking been smoking no weed. I said, you're a fucking liar. He says, I'm telling you right now, bro, you failed the piss test, and we're going to let you go. And I was like, I was like, dude, I says, you're a fucking piece of shit. And I said, I'm going to fucking see you guys. And I remember, he said, go ahead, big man. And he says, good luck with that. He says, okay, you ain't got a chance of beating Vince. And I was like, man, fuck you, you piece of shit. And I grabbed my shit, and I fucking went home, man. And... They had replaced me with a buddy of mine that I wrestled with over in Europe, uh, Rambo. His name was Luke Poirier. He's a French Canadian, great worker. And they replaced him or me with him. And, you know, the way I look at it is if they had replaced me with some fucking jabroni, I'd have been pissed off. But they didn't. They replaced me with a buddy that I worked with every night for like the past six years, right? A good friend of mine. And so, I didn't, I didn't really, it didn't really bother me too much, you know, I was like, well, fuck it. And then after that, they got rid of the commandant and brought the jackal in. And then they were on TV, I don't know, for a few months, and then they just kind of fucking petered out, right? Yeah, basically, they didn't really last uh, too long. But did you really fail the test, or was he fucking with you? No, he was just fucking with me, but he still fucking fired me on the spot. He says, he said, you failed your fucking piss test. He says, so, he says, you can no longer work for this company. I'm going to have to let you go. I'm like, what? And I knew that I was clean, right? I was like, I want to see the fucking results. He was like, I don't have them. So the doctor got him. He says, what do you think I'm lying? He says, yeah, motherfucker, you're lying. I mean, it was a big hole of blue right in the middle of this big fucking uh, open area because I was walking to fucking catering. And you had to walk through this big ass fucking room and go through some doors. And then on the other side, you had to go through another set of doors. And I was like halfway in. And, like, Bruce was fucking following me, so he was a man on a mission, man. I don't know what his heart on was for me, but, like I said, he acted like he liked me doing the fucking Mantar character, but then 
when it came to the truth commission, the very first chance he got to fucking fire me, he fucking fired me. So I don't know what's up his fucking ass. Man, he just didn't like you <laughs> for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. yeah. No, I guess I didn't suck no dick, so they didn't fucking want me around, right? I mean, because I'm not, I'm not one of the, I'm not one of them ass kissers, you know. I'm not a yes man, and uh, you know, you're not gonna make me look fucking stupid. And um, I remember when I had to wrestle uh, Bob Spark Plug Holly. I think it was a Survivor Series, and um, I think we wrestled like seven, eight minutes, nine minutes later. And I literally fucking threw him around like a rag doll. Just beat the fucking shit out of him, man. Threw him, did everything to him. And then at the end, um, he hit me with that fucking missile drop kick off the top rope. And he hit me one, two, three. And I remember when he got me one, two, three, people start chanting, bullshit, bullshit. They knew that shit wasn't real because I beat the fucking shit out of him. Because the only thing he got was the fucking finish. And he pinned me, right? I was like, man, I packed my bag and I was like, fuck you, motherfuckers, I'm done with you. This is what I do with the Manslark character, right? Because I'm like, you're not going to destroy me. You're not going to make me look fucking bad, right? Because I might go somewhere else if I can work. Yeah, definitely. With that, like, were they supposed to do more with Manslark? <clears throat> like, you know, you're saying, like, you, you lost to Valhalla, but you can't dominate the match. Were they supposed to do more with the character? This is one time. And one time they were talking about having a feud with the Undertaker. Wow. You know? And um, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the word the word was around the locker room that that I was stiff. And okay, you know what? That's true because when I would work with you, I would say, listen, if you're gonna drop kick me, or you're gonna close on me, or you're gonna fucking punch me, lay that shit in. Because if you don't, I'm not fucking selling it. Because I'm 410 fucking pounds, and you're not gonna make me look stupid out there. I said I would rather have you fucking stiff me. And fucking make it miss me by a fucking country mile, right? And so I would tell everybody at Russell up front. And I remember um, the night it was Moline, Illinois. I took one of my best friends. It was like an eight-hour drive up to Moline. Go up there for television, Monday Night Raw. And I got there and I found out that I had to wrestle Bret Hart. And um, Jerry Briscoe says, "Hey, Mike, he says Bret wants to talk to you um, before the match." I was like, "Yeah, okay, no problem." So Bret and I got together. And he was like, "Hey, listen, man." He says, "I just want to be up front with you." He says, um, nobody wants to work with you. Everybody says you're fucking stiff, that you're fucking hurting them. He says, but you know what? He says, I love your style of fucking work. And he says, I can appreciate a guy who weighs that shit and makes it look real. He said, after all, he said, this isn't fucking ballet. And he said, they're just a bunch of fucking prima donnas in this locker room, right? And he was like, so let's go out there and have a good match. And he laid it out. Boom. We went out there and fucking killed it. I mean, killed it. This, that bitch, when he... When uh, Brett got back to the locker room, he went right to fucking Vince and said, Vince, this fucking guy can work. I don't know what everybody else is talking about, but this guy's a great worker. And um, I just had a point with one of my best matches that I ran out there with, with Mike. And he says, it was good. He says, we went over it. And he says, we went out there and fucking killed it. And I remember when it, it was on, um, I think they put it on Superstars. And I remember action one zone. day, yeah, the action zone on Saturday morning. Yep. And uh, I remember they cut the most important part of the match out. And fucking Brett called me up. He said, did you see that shit? I was like, yeah. He said, man, he says, I'm going to take care of that shit, man. He said, that was bullshit. He said, they just cut the best part of our fucking match out of it. And he said, so it made no sense. He said, we planned it out, boom, boom, boom. And he says, it went fucking smooth as silk. And they cut the most important part of the fucking match out. He was pissed. Fucking pissed. Really? Because I remember, because I watched it not that long ago, it's on YouTube. It's a pretty good match, but I think it's, you know, it's long for a TV match, but it's actually longer, so they cut some stuff out of it? That, that, yeah, from they, what cut, they, they, cut, they cut some stuff out, you know. Um, wow. And I remember I remember when Brett was making his comeback, I think he dropped the, dropped the fucking punch off the second rope, and then um, he did the fucking Russian leg sleep on me, and... Um, and something happened, we went outside, and I had him up against the fucking post, and I went to punch him, and he moved, and I ended up punching the fucking post for real, and you could hear my fucking head hit the fucking post. He was like, he was like, stiffy, <laughs> he started laughing, and um, but we went out and had a great match, and um, Brett was pretty pissed off, they cut the best part of the match out, but yeah, Brett, 
Brett, uh, Brett's a great guy, man. He was probably one of my best nineties ever. What do you think about just in general his work in the ring? I mean, everyone highly regards him as one of the best. Do you agree? One of the best ever? Yeah, one. You know, absolutely, one hundred percent. I would say he's probably the best Canadian to ever come out of Canada. You know, I seem to tell you somebody else would tell you Nightheart about they were the top three or four people in in Canada, and she said Bret Hart, Stu Hart, Owen Hart, and then she uh, threw out Edge out there, right? And um, since Edge was, you know, past his prime, he's still out there killing it, you know, and people, people know he's in pain, but he's still out there killing it, so uh, more power to him, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Now, with Undertaker, why'd they scrap that feud? How come it never happened? I have no idea. I have no idea, because I remember one day Taylor came up to me. He was like, hey, big man, he said, just want to let you know, man, that you know, we're going to do a little fucking steal together. He said, so get ready, man, because we're going to the big time. I was like, thanks, bro. And I'm like, I remember when he walked away, and I fucking you know, looked up at the sky. I was like, wow, man, thank you, God, you know, because all you need to do is have a good feed with fucking Taylor to elevate your status on the roster, right? And yep. so that would have been a, that would have been a chance of a lifetime for me. What did you think about him as the, the conscience, the, the locker room leader? What did you think about him as the person? Yeah, I totally agree with that assessment. You know, he definitely was the voice of the locker room. He definitely carried all the respect there. And if you know, Mark said something, you listened listen to him, right? Because he um, definitely knew what he was talking about. Was there a lot of locker room dissension, like BSK, which is obviously his group, the Click, which is Michael's group, and those guys? Like, was there a lot of that dissension? Because some people said yes, and some people said, eh, no, it's not. It's kind of more overblown by the fans than it really was. No, absolutely not, man. The Click was fucking for real, man. If somebody in the Click didn't like you, you were gone. And that's what happened to me, man. I almost got a fight with Razor in the ring. Actually, did get into a little fight. Got in a fight with him in the locker room. And, um, Shit, two months later in Survivor Series, I did a job for Bob Holly and the mentor was done. Right? And um, and I knew that it fucking came from that, man. But I, I didn't care, man. Like I said, I'm not a yes man. I ain't no fucking punk. You're not going to try and knock me out in the middle of the ring with the fucking open hand slap. Because um, if you think that shit's fucking going to fucking knock me up down, you're fucking out of your mind, man. You know, fucking Razor hit me with an open hand slap and hit me as hard as he fucking could. And I just fucking shook that shit off, man, and fucking picked him up and put him in the corner and started fucking blasting him. And I remember Big Scott, the fucking referee, said, here, and he was like, tell them two fuckers to save that shit in the back. They're on national TV. Wow, really? Yeah, yeah. Ray's a fucking prick. So what happened? He just it, did his normal open hand slap, or he was trying to be a little aggressive with so, you? So at this point in time, I was undefeated in the WWF, right? I was, I don't know, maybe 15 or 16 and fucking all. I haven't lost yet. And um, Razor just came back from his 17th time in drug rehab. And before he went into drug rehab, he dropped the belt to Double J and Maroney. And so he came out of fucking rehab, and I was his very first match out of fucking rehab. And so... They said, okay, well, we're not going to, you know, Mantar is undefeated, and we know that Scott, you're already established, but we don't want to fucking be in clean in the fucking ring. And so they said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a thing where fucking the razor gives you the fucking razor's edge or something, and then the fucking roadie pops up on the fucking apron and gets razor's attention. I fucking recover. I fucking... Um, Razor's back now, Razor's over by the roadie, and the roadie's got his attention and his back to me. I get up, I do the fucking mantra shuffle. I charge him, Razor fucking sees me, sidesteps me, throws me over the top rope. I land on the fucking roadie, and we got counted out 10, right? Well, when we first started talking about the match, you know, Razor's like, I want to get this in, I want to get that in. And, you know, and, and I know that he can do it to big guys, all this shit that he's calling, right? Because I've seen him. She didn't do it. She was doing the shit to Vader and stuff. So, you know, if you can do this other shit to Vader, he can do it to me. Right? And um, so I was like, all right, man. I was like, but listen, I want to get my shit in too. You know, I said, I haven't lost yet. I said, I'm trying to build a name for myself. And I said, and so, you know, it's going to be a give or take, or it's going to be nothing at all. 
And he goes, no, we'll go out there and have a good match, man. We'll go out there and have a good match. So we went out there in the very first fucking spot, you know how Razor spits his fucking and flicks his toothpick at the motherfuckers. Well, he did this opening spot where I pushed him off a couple of times, pushed him off a couple of times, went to lock up again, went to throw him a clothesline, he ducked the fucking clothesline, took his toothpick out and fucking flicked it at me. And then he fucking, um, so we locked up the fucking second time, he ducked the clothesline again, I turned around, he open hand slaps me. And so when he open hand slapped me, bro, he tried to slap the chicklets out of my mouth. And I've heard Diesel talk about this on a few podcasts before. And when he, Diesel tells it where he's sitting in the back with the boys and the fucking catering and watching on the monitor. And he says, and he says, next thing I know, man, Scott's wrestling fucking Mantor. And Scott hit fucking Mantor so hard, man, he knocked the fucking snot out of his mouth. And I, he was like, man, he was like, I said, I thought he fucking should have knocked his ass out. I think, man, he was fucking far from it, man. And um, I remember, you know, when he fucking opened hand fucking slapped me, and I shook that shit off and fucking scooped him up, threw him in the fucking corner, bam, 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 and fucking fight was on. And then next thing you know, Vincent Fan's on the fucking earpiece telling us to calm down while I'm national TV. Right? So then we got in the fucking back, so after I get the count out of 10, fucking I jump up, man, I fucking go right to the fucking behind the curtain. I'm waiting for this motherfucker. He comes to the guy right in his fucking face, man. And we start fucking pushing and shoving, calling fucking names and shit. Agents start fucking pulling us a book apart. Yeah, Scott Hall is a fucking pussy. I don't give a shit if he's dead or not. He's still a fucking pussy. Was it like just legit heat between you guys? Did it just get heated in the ring? I mean, he just didn't like you no, from the get-go. He just, he just, obviously he took a fucking liberty, right? Because he got, he got along with my fucking partner, P.N. News, really well in WCW. Uh, yeah. Listening to my partner, listening to my partner tell the story, right? They got along great. And um, but for some reason, Scott didn't fucking like me. And, you know, when I was over in Europe, I missed Scott by like two years. I think he was over at WrestleCon, over somewhere as well. Because anybody with somebody has wrestled in that territory, who's old school wrestler. They wrestled a lot of arms in that German Austrian territory, right? And um, so, yeah, man, I don't know. I don't know why he didn't like me. He just took a cheap shot. And um, I let him know right then and there I wasn't going to fucking have it. And, you know, I called out the fucking one of the main dudes in the fucking click. And two months later, fucking Bob Holly's fucking pinned me right in the middle of the fucking ring. <laughs> That that shows you yeah the, the power the politics yeah you gotta yeah you gotta yeah, find that mind the click, yeah the click the click was fucking strong bro I mean if they didn't like you you were doomed guaranteed you were doomed you know and, and like I said I was no ass kisser I was one of them guys that was I'm like the lone wolf right I don't have no I don't need no fucking pack I don't need no fucking friends it's always nice to have friends watching back right. But I don't need anybody, man. I can ride along, and um, I ride along. It, it's funny because, like, that happens. You start losing to Duke Dumpster Drosy. You start losing to Man Mountain Rock. You kind of see the writing on the wall. Like, I'm getting jobbed out here. And then, uh, obviously, Bob Holly on TV and pay-per-view. So, Yeah, and once, once that happened, man, you know, um, I just said, uh, fuck it, I'm done. I, fucking went, I, I remember I went in the back. I took my gear off, I fucking cleaned the paint off my face. I didn't even take a shower. Uh, I didn't even take a shower. And um, I just fucking got my bags, got my car, and we went to the airport. And I was calling on the, on the way to the airport to change my ticket back to Omaha. Man, just it's crazy to think like. Did they really think that gimmick was going to work? And then they were they were giving you something, but that you know, and then that happens, and you start losing. Did you really think that gimmick would work though in that era, or no? Um, you know, for the time, for the era that it was going on, they had all them stupid fucking gimmicks, right? Yep. I mean, all of them. They had the fucking Repo Man. They had the Red Rooster. They had the Bastion Booger, they had Duke the Dumpster Grossi. Um, they had all these stupid fucking gimmicks. And, um, you know, it was just that, just that time where they just, you know, instead of making a character himself or someone, a persona that has to do with myself, um, an alter ego or something, they put me, you know, make me do something that I'm not even 
Tony's not even involved in. When you do leave, you do come back a few times. Like you mentioned the, the time with uh, the Truth Commission. Like who keeps bringing you back? Like you returned 96, you returned 97. Like how does that keep happening? You know, and I also, a lot of people don't know this, but they brought me back also to do the gangster character that I thought they should have done when they did the Mantar character. They wanted me to do the bodyguard character. Um, for Gold Dust in, in your house pay per view, and I'm on a brass against the Ultimate Warrior because right. Gold Dust blew, blew a Z out over in fucking Europe on the European tour, and they were the main event, and they couldn't cancel. It was too late, and so they was like, "Okay, we'll we'll pay you. We want we want to use this character." So they knew, they knew what character I was doing, right? Yep. And, but they still chose to put this fucking Mantar character on me. It makes makes no sense. So who brought you back to be with Goldust? Though, like who? It's not Bruce Pritchard, right? Is it Jim Ross? Um, I want to say it was Jim Ross or JJ Dillon. One of them. It might have been Jim Ross. You know, um, I don't think Jim Ross liked me very much either. But he asked me if I was interested. I said yeah, and I said okay. Well, we we'll give you five grand and you know come in and do this, but. When I got to the arena, they said, okay, Mike, this is what we want to do. But we have to wait and run it by um, the ultimate warrior um, to make sure that he's okay with doing it. Because um, if he's not okay with it, we can't do it. I was like, okay, so Warrior Green came, showed up like four o'clock, and um, Talked to him and talked to him and we got it all worked out and it worked out for him to school. What did you think of Warrior? What did you think of him? Um, he was a great guy and very professional. I heard a lot of horror stories about him uh, with the ego trip and not just not showing up and you know if he doesn't want to do it, you know we can't do it. We got to do what he wants to do and all that. All that shit. So, um, it's a, uh, I don't know, you know, he's a great guy. You know, we went in there, we did it, it was easy. And, you know, after he closed on me over the top, rolled backwards, he, my hat fell off and he picked it up and put it on his fucking head and climbed up to the top rope and did his warrior thing. So he's up there promoting fucking Bruiser Mastino, um, in my fucking, where my fucking door, right? So, Oh, good, quick five grand for me. Did you think it was going to lead to something longer and and like a longer stay there, and you were going to be Goldust's like bodyguard full time? Um, I was hoping, you know, because we really worked out a good a good thing. I mean, you know, it all went down as, as planned. It was smooth as silk, and they were very happy with it. And Goldust was happy with it. He was really happy because. You know, his fucking knee was in a brace. He couldn't fucking hardly walk. He was basically on crutches. And, you know, he had Marlena there. And uh, we all worked great together. All three of us were great. And, you know, the warrior in there and doing uh, the director's chair in the middle of the ring. Did the whole cigar thing, man. That was, that was good times. It seems like, you know, like you kind of have a, a, a foot, like a footing in and you kind of don't. And then they bring you back, like you said, in, in 97. <laughs> Did that frustrate you? Is that like a regret of yours? Are you, are you pissed about that looking back? Because it's like you were there in 95, 96, 97, but not for a long period of time, and it wasn't like a, a, a big deal. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, and, and the thing is, it was almost like they were trying to fucking rid me. Um, because in the end, they did the gangster character that I, that I wanted to fucking do originally, but I thought would have made the most money. Because like I said, it was previous to years, and you know, Mr. Hughes made some pretty good fucking jack doing that gangster gimmick. And I think I done it a whole hell of a lot better than he did. Um, but it was pretty Hughes. And um, they finally gave me a chance to do it. And it works out great, man. Everything, you know, works out soon as silk. And then they, they take it away from me. You know, don't call me after that. So I was a little disappointed. But, you know, what can you do? You know, I mean, they don't want to use you. They don't want to use you, you know. 
Did you ever have any sort of relationship with Vince McMahon? Did you ever talk to him just more than just him loving the, the Mantar gimmick and the, the hundred thousand dollar head? Any other like kind of relationship or stories with Vince? No, you know, um, I remember one time, um, I think I showed up, uh, showed up at a show in Omaha. Um, I went there to see uh, Dave Fett Finley. He's a good friend of mine that I went with over in Europe, Rod Vox. Taught me the business, man. I know he's stand up character. And um, so I went there and see him. And, um, I remember I was weighing like, I don't know, 340 pounds and, and I was sitting there fucking eating with Dave and Vince came up to me on the fucking shoulder. He's like, my colleague, he said, how the hell are you, man? He says, it's your hometown, huh? He's like, yeah. I stood up, shook his hand and he's like, man, he says, you're looking pretty, pretty fit, man. I said, well, just wait for that phone call, Vince, you know, just wait for that phone call. And, um, and you know, that was kind of it. And the airport story in Denver and then, um, I remember me and my tag team partner, PN News, uh, Dave Finley got us to try out in like 98, I believe, or, no, sorry, 2009, 2010, got us to try out, and we went down to the Camp Arena down in Kansas City, and, um, or, sorry, the new arena in Kansas City, and uh, we went to the new arena, and we wrestled as the Brotherhood as a tag team, because we were the tag team champs over in Europe, and um, I remember, when we got there, there were guys that were still working there in the locker room that were there when I did the Mantar character and I did the Tate character and I did the fucking bodyguard character. So all these people fucking see me and knew me, worked with me in all the years past. But nobody fucking talked to me. Nobody. Nobody talked to Paul. People knew Paul from the WCW locker room. Nobody fucking talked to him. And so we're sitting there in the catering, just minding our own business, drinking a soda. And I remember as soon as Dave Pitt Finley and Dean Malenko came up and said, hey, Paul, hey, Mike, how you guys doing? Give us hugs and shit. Then everybody came out of thought of woodwork and was talking to us, right? Because if Dean Malenko and Dave Pitt Finley are talking to you, well, then you must be somebody fucking important because these two guys ain't nothing to shake a stick at, right? These two guys got top-notch fucking reputations. And um, so we went out there and we did... uh, we were, we were standing out there waiting. They were going over some people that were trying out. And um, I remember um, Harley had Nicole Bass, had Nicole Bass there and was trying to get uh, John Laurinaitis to look at her because John Laurinaitis was in the ring when everybody was doing the tryouts. And so um, he, was like, he was like, Harley, wait a minute. And so he says, uh, you two in the ring. So then we went and did our fucking spiel. And as soon as we came out of the ring, Harley Race is like, John, 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 I need to talk to you. John's like, fuck off, Harley, I ain't got time. We got to talk to these two guys. I'm taking them in the back right now. And so we went in the back of the locker room. And when we wrestled our match, when we wrestled our match, bro, we cleared out the fucking locker room. I mean, everybody who was in the locker room, whether it was The Rock or Stone Cold or The Big Show, fucking you name it, man, all the big guys, everybody that was on the fucking show was standing on the fucking ramp or out in the ring area when me and my partner fucking went in the ring and wrestled. And I guarantee you, man, there was like, there is no fucking way that we can bring these two 400 fucking pound guys in because they are not going to be easy to fucking work with. And they are going to get over like Rover, and we're afraid of that. So everybody who cock blocked it could have cock blocked it, right? So I mean, we, were, we were in the best shape. We were in the best shape of our life, man. I was 362 pounds, and I had a fucking six pack. Fucking Paul was benching over 60. He was benching 660. We were in the best shape of our life, man. We were in the gym for like a year fucking straight, two times a day, man. We were in shape, ready for this fucking tryout. And we got fucking blackballed. Did they ever tell tell you, hey, you're not getting signed? You are like they never kind of said anything no, to you. John guys? said, John said, well, the check to be in the band. We're gonna tell you the check, and I've uh, got our information. He says that we'll be in contact. And not only did we not get the check, the three hundred dollar check or whatever the fuck they were gonna pay us, but we never got that phone call. 
So, wow. Know, total bullshit. But I mean to tell you what, bro, and that was a high, that's a highlight of my career. You know, that's like my WrestleMania fucking moment right there. Uh, because anybody who was somebody in that fucking locker room that was in catering fucking eating, and when we fucking hit the ring and they see us on the monitor, everybody came out and was standing. There was a hundred guys standing on that fucking ramp, man. And they were all watching two four hundred pounders fucking demolish these fucking two guys. I mean, we ate them up. And they were just what? like, wow, what the fuck? This is like road warrior type shit, but these guys are four hundred pounds a piece. I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of the fucking feeling that was in the arena that day. I mean, it was it was fucking I mean it was I felt so good. I thought that we had the fucking spots locked up, brother. Thought we had them locked up. That's how good I was on top of my game. I looked the best pose fucking in shape. We looked fucking bad as a motherfucker and they fucking blew us off. Damn, what a shame. And it's interesting yeah. too because did you almost get signed by WCW at one point in the 90s? I know you wrestled Damien in a dark match, but was that ever a possibility, getting signed with WCW? Yeah, you know, I was down there a little bit training the fucking power plant, you know, uh, you know, really, really try to break you down and see if you really want it. Well, you ain't going to fucking break me down, man. I'm a fucking true champion. I'm a born champion. And I'll do what it takes to get where I have to go. And there ain't no quit in fucking Mantar. And so... I did all the fucking bullshit that they were doing in the power plant, squats, sit-ups, push-ups, doing it all, went there, fucking had some great matches in the power plant, went and did a TV thing, and then nothing, nothing. Crazy. What about ECW? Because I know you had a bunch of matches for them, too. No you know, no inkling of getting signed there either, right? Um, no, I worked up there for, I don't know, two, three months with Paul, yeah. You know, Paulie just was one of the type of guys where he just might not decide he don't want to pay you that night, right? And I did that to a lot of guys, and I just got tired of waiting for my fucking money. I mean, in fact, I think Paulie still owes me like 320 bucks. But my mind served it correctly. Wow, still. I mean, I know it's a story yeah, from a lot of different yeah. guys, but still owes you uh, all that money. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. I bet you. Listen, I bet you he still owes a lot of people, man. I bet you the 320 he me. It's something pocket change compared to what he owes some of these things, right? So that's why you stopped working there. I mean, it was a you were only I think yeah. maybe a handful of matches, but you just stopped because of the lack of pay. Yeah, it just it just the pay was fucking shit. So you never you know, you get to the next town and and if he owes you fucking three hundred or four hundred, he might give you two hundred and say, Well, I owe you two hundred and he already owed you fucking, you know, hundred and fifty from the fucking night before and I just kept fucking snowballing and he just wasn't catching and getting caught up fast enough for me, and um, I said, I got to go. I remember I was I was living with one of the pit bulls at the time, uh, uh, Anthony Durani. And um, I was like, listen, I was staying with him in South Philly, in fucking South Philly, and, um, in the fucking hood. And I'm right across the street from fucking Gino fucking uh, cheesesteaks place. And, um, and it was, uh, I was like, I can't do this, man. I got to go back to the bar. When you look at like the, the run, it seems like Europe was very kind to you. Maybe not here in the states with the, you know the few short yeah. runs at WWF yeah. and you know, USWA, but how come Europe was such like a great destination for it? it seems like Otto Vons and CWA was like your go-to. It was, you know, and um, the thing about that is Otto loved big guys. Oh, he loved fucking big guys, especially big guys that can move and work like I could, and so. I remember when we got there, it was on a story that I'd been wrestling for two years. I was right directly out of fucking training camp. I had one fucking professional wrestling match. And my first match was in Dortmund, Germany, in front of 9,000 fucking people. And a championship against my buddy, Luke Poirier, who I mentioned before with the, with the Truth Commission, right? So he was the champ, and I had to wrestle him. And um, I remember I got through it, and after, you know, I, I went and got my pay and shit. And um, I was like, how long have you been working? And Paul told me to tell everybody two years, right? So I told everybody two years. And so I told him, two years. He was like, how long? It's like, two years. He says, Mike, tell me the truth. He says, I know you ain't been working for two years. He says, I like your style. He says, but you got a lot to learn. 
And he says, but this is the place to do it. He said, so how long have you been working? He said, you want to know the chief boss? He said, yeah. I said, this is my very first professional wrestling match. He said, he slammed his fucking hand on the table. He said, you got to be fucking kidding me, Mastino. He says, your very first match. He says, you did one hell of a job, man, for your first match. He says, if you want to stay here and you want to learn how to fucking uh, the profession of professional wrestling, he says, we start the next city in three days in Bremen. He says, we're there for 38 days. I'm going to give you $365 a day. Uh, American, I'm going to pay you every two days. Are you in or are you out? I said, I'm in, boss. And that fucking, the rest was history, man. He fucking loved me, man. I wrestled Big Otto three or four times over there. And, uh, you know, great fucking guy. He built his name up when he bought that heavyweight championship off of the AWA, Nick Bockwinkle. Remember when he beat Nick Bockwinkle for the AWA heavyweight championship? Well, he took that fucker back to Europe. And when he, he brought it to his hometown, and that turned in, him into a fucking god, bro. Turned him into an instant millionaire. That 50 or $75,000 investment that he made fucking was well worth it for him. And um, so, I mean, he loved big guys. And so he brought me back, and he called me every fucking spring. He says, hey, Mastino, you want to come back to Europe? I was like, hell yeah. He goes, all right. Uh, yeah, you'll have your tickets in a week. Says I'll see you in a few weeks. I was like, okay, boss. That's his history, man. Eight, eight, and a, eight and a half months, man, straight over a year, right? Yeah, and then you re- would return a few times. Huh? So you had a couple runs in Europe for CWA. Oh, yeah, I worked over there for shit. I don't know, eight or nine years, probably. Total. Long time. Crazy, some of the guys, if you look who you work like, Dave Taylor, Regal, even Chris Benoit. What was uh, Benoit like? So when I first got there, this was 91, 92, um, Dave Taylor kind of took me underneath his wing. And um, him and my partner, Paul, were really good friends. And so, but Dave kind of took me underneath his wing and kind of taught me the business. And so that first 38 days, um, the top baby faces over there at the time were Owen Hart and Chris Benoit, Tony Sinclair, and Dave Taylor. Well, Owen and Benoit were two of the best workers, so I would wrestle each one of them in singles matches every week. And then me and Dave would wrestle them in like tag teams like twice a week. And when I wasn't wrestling them, I was wrestling Dave Taylor, Tony Sinclair, you know, Steve Regal wasn't there at the time. Um, but these, but you know, Chris Benoit and Owen Hart, they had a lot to do with teaching me the job. You know, because I worked with these guys on a nightly basis. I worked with them five nights a week. I was wrestling one of them. And um, I really learned a lot from those guys. You know, I'll, I'll never forget it. You know, people say, well, who taught you the business? Well, Dean Malenko and Jody Malenko and Larry Malenko, their father, taught me the job. But Dave Fit Finley and Owen Hart and Chris Benoit, they gave me firsthand wrestling experience on a nightly basis. You know, and I'm wrestling three of the fucking best technical wrestlers in the whole fucking world, right? And um, so I was blessed. What did you think of Benoit as like the person, Benoit the guy? I mean, what, what was he like? You know, what, I'm, what I remember of Chris back then was, um, he was just very quiet, always to himself, you know. Um, just kind of doing his own little wolf, you know. Just kind of was doing his own thing, beating, marching to his own drum. And um, Owen, of course, Owen was a fucking pistol. Um, Owen was just Owen. And I remember when I first got to New York, when I did the Mantar character, um, Owen was one of the first guys that came up to me and gave me a big hug and fucking and catering. He was like. Bruiser Mastino, you know it, Mike. Don't give me a big fucking hug and shit. Owen used to, Owen used to be the best river man there ever was. You know, he'd walk around with a towel on his arm and a squirt gun underneath that fucking towel, and he's walking by you in the fucking hallway. He's gonna blast you in the fucking eye. With that squirt gun, you're like, what the fuck? Where did that come from? And Owen just got a fucking towel on his arm. You don't think it's him? I remember one time, man. Um, I just got a new suitcase. 
just bought a new Halliburton. And because I had a soft one before and it just wasn't working out, so I bought a Halliburton, a hard one. And I went to the, uh, the seamstress things because they used to help me paint my face. And so I went to paint my fucking face and I came back and my Halliburton has a fucking logging chain wrapped around it. And it's chained to the fucking bench. And it's got a lock on it, the size of a fucking football. Right, what a huge ass lock. I'm like, oh my god, what am I gonna do? And so uh, I'm looking around, I'm talking, I'm looking for the fucking maintenance guy, and I finally find the maintenance guy, and I've been searching for like an hour, hour, fifteen minutes. And it's I, I'm, I'm on in like fucking ten minutes, and I finally shut down the maintenance guy because Owen said, "Listen, just go and hide, man. Just if you see this big fucking guy with." The corns on his head, man. Just tell him no, no, nothing. Just act stupid. And so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was totally all in on the given. It was totally all in, right? Because he'll do whatever it takes sometimes to pull off a rib, right? Oh, yeah. he'll go that extra fucking, he'll go that extra mile to pull the rib off. And so, I remember I tracked down the fucking dude and I'm sweating balls, man. I fucking paint starting to fucking run. And I'm like, fuck, man, I'm in my socks and my, and my uh, trunks. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I get in that suitcase. So I find the maintenance guy and he says, Listen, man, I was like, if you fucking give me a pair of fucking uh, bolt cutters, I said, I'll give you 50 bucks, man. I said, I need to get in my suitcase. Some fuckers pulled a rib on me and chained my suitcase to the bench. And the guy said, Well, let me see, 50 bucks, huh? And I was like, Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I guess I can handle for 50 bucks. And so he gets some bolt cutters and I'm rushing him down the fucking hallway. I see like we got to go a fucking mile, but. It's a locker room, right? Because I mean, I'm on in like fucking seven, eight minutes. And um, I finally get it over, man. He fucking busted, man. I fucking bust that thing off. I give him the fucking 50. And um, Owen's like, Owen comes in. He says, Hey, Bruiser. He says, uh, See, you finally got that suitcase open, huh? He says, That was one hell of a fucking padlock on that fucker. He says, You never padlock that. I never put that on there. He says, I don't think they like you very much. And um, so the fucking maintenance guy gives Owen the fucking 50 bucks that I paid him. He says, here, he says, you can have it. I don't want it. And Owen said, oh, Bruce, he said, is this your 50? He says, jokes on me, buddy. He says, better hurry up, man. You're out in five minutes, right? So I had to put my boots on, my sealant on, my all my pads, my tape. I mean, I was fucking hustling, man. But fucking Owen pulled the ultimate rib, man, and fucking... Just got my bag over in the nick of time. Good times, man. Oh, I miss Owen a lot, you know, because, um, you know, Brent and I, we, we have each other's numbers and I'll text Brent every now and then, you know, just to say hello. And, um, you know, he he said that Owen would say nothing but good things about me, man. And he said, so if my brother liked you, he says, and I like you. And, you know, Brent even took a, a more shining to me after we went and had that great match, right? Yeah, for sure. That's pretty awesome, though, with Owen. I mean, always known as the, the consummate river, you know, just nothing hellacious, but uh, nothing crazy, but just a good river. Funny guy. Yeah, totally, totally. So as we hit the wind down here, we head towards the finish. What's next for you? I know a few years ago you did wrestle GCW, uh, Game Changer. You were in the clusterfuck with Joey Jalen and stuff. Like, are you still wrestling? Or will you wrestle in the future? What's What's next for you? Well, you know, I'm, I'm down here. I'm living in Florida, as you know, already down in Southern Cape Cod, Florida, Southwest Florida. And life is great down here, man. I've uh, been down here for about 10, 11 months now. Almost a year on May 14th on my birthday. And, um, you know, I, I just been kind of pillow dicking around the gym. I've grown like 35 pounds already. So I'm down to like 370. And um, if I can get down to three and a quarter, which I'm really honestly trying to get down and cut that weight. If I can get down to three and a quarter, you know, I'll start working again. You know, I've been getting a lot of phone calls. My message has been blowing up. Most people want me to do podcasts. And, want me to come in and do signings and yep. wrestle on tag or do a run in, you know, anything. I was like, listen, if you just do a run in, I'll be happy with that. So, you know, I'm trying to put myself out there more now. Um, I have my own podcast uh, now, actually, where we just got done taping episode eight. 
Um, it's actually on Monty and the Pharaoh Network right now at Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern. So instead of uh, me watching the podcast, um, I'm on here with you, Big John. She yeah. Shit, man. Entertain nice. Fans. And, you know, so we're on the Monty and the Pharaoh Network. Um, our podcast is called SOB Sports Network. Something on boys or son of a bitch, whatever you want to call us. It's SLP yep. Sports Network. And um, you can look us up on uh, YouTube and we're on Podbean and stuff like that. And um, we're just trying to get started, getting our, getting our names out there. But I'm getting a lot of interest now. And um, I've kind of opened up the floodgates on, on the Facebook and you know, open up Instagram or Twitter. You know, um, you know, hopefully I'll be dabbling a few movies this summer. Um, so yeah, man, things are things are looking up, and um, you know, I'm I'm training every day for bigger and better things to come later on this summer. Nice, sounds great. Sounds like you got uh, a lot of things down the down the hopper there. Yeah, down the pike yeah, up. you know, I mean, we've been we've been doing this podcast stuff for a long time now, and it seems to be working out for you. You know, you've interviewed a lot of a lot of top guys, and you really got your your brand out there and your name out there, and you know. I'm, I envy it because, you know, that's not easy to do. And, you know, me and Peter News, we're only on episode eight. But, you know, we're getting a lot of positive feedback. You've got a lot of guys love us. And the thing is, is both him and myself have been cock blocked so many times that now nobody can cock block us because it's our own show. And we can do whatever the hell we want. We can say what we want. And, you know, um, I'm sure you heard that story a couple weeks ago of WrestleMania about. Uh, about uh, who was it? Um, Rick Steiner. Said yeah. Something to that, to, said something to that transvestite, right? And um, I chimed in and I said, you know, I said, I agree with Rick Steiner. I was like, there's no room in sports for someone who's transgender, period. There's no fucking room in sports for it. You know, it's just not fair. You know, you got a man that can beat, competes in swimming events and comes in a hundred place every time. And then he says, well, I'm a fucking she now. And so he starts competing in women's swimming events. And now he's winning the fucking gold medal. I mean, is that right? I don't think so. You know, I mean, you know, God made a man, he God made a woman. And he don't talk about no fucking mixture. He don't talk about no transgender, nothing in the Bible. And, you know, I'm old school. So, you know, I, I signed with Rick Steiner on that. You know, and I felt some flack. You know, but I really don't give a fucking shit because it's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. And if you don't like it, then fucking don't listen to me or turn away. You know, but in my opinion, there is absolutely no fucking room in sports for someone who is transgender. Now, if you want to live your life as a transgender, I'm all for it, bro. You want to go out and party and have dinner and go to nightclubs and, you know, go to grocery stores as a, as a woman. And you're a man, hey, more power to you. Just stay the fuck out of sports. That's all I'm saying. Just stay out of sports. I, I'm not a homophobe. I'm not a transphobe. And I've been called them all, man, trust me. And like I said, I really don't give a shit. But in my opinion, there's just no fucking room at all. Not one inch, not one centimeter, not anything. There's no room in sports for someone who's transgender. Well, as far as you and obviously, you know, you got the podcast. Can you wrestle one last match, like, or or, or maybe several matches, or, or what? Yeah, you know, I mean, if I if I could drop another 45, 50 pounds, you know, probably years to start wrestling again, you know, at least once a month. And um, you know, I could go out there and you know, take a bump here and a bump there. I really don't have to bump around. I'm four hundred pounds, right? I mean, we need more ways to work around that for sure. But. Um, you know, I miss entertainment, and that's why, you know, Paul and I started this podcast, SLB Sports Network, you know, because we miss entertaining our fans so much. And this gives us a chance to get up front and personal and let the fans know who we really are as, as people, right? I mean, because I'm no different than you just because I did three different characters for the WWF. I'm no better than you are. Um, I just got a chance, and I got the ball, and I ran with it, and I did the best I could with what I was dealt. And so, you know, I mean, I'm sure if you would have had the chance, you would have put your mark on the business somehow, right? So, I mean, I don't think I'm better than you or better than anybody else. I'm just a lucky guy who, who got a break and me and God happened to be dialing like this, like two flat tires, right? 
So, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. So good. Well, Mike, thank you so much, uh, or Mantar, thank you so much uh, for all the time tonight. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, John. Anytime, man. I'd like to come on and, and talk to you anytime. You know, I might even have you on uh, on our podcast someday. We'll bring you on SOB Sports, right? and we can do an interview with you. We can interview you. We can kind of switch the roles a little bit. You know? All right. I like and that. that. I'm down. I'm yeah, down for that. You know, that's, when that's what it's about, man, is just promote each other and and to tell, tell honest and truthful stories and tell funny stories, right? That people would have no idea what's going on behind closed doors unless people tell stories. Yep. It all comes from your, your experiences, your life, your real life experiences. And so, you know, if you find my real life's experiences entertaining and interesting, then I'm still doing my job, right? And like I said earlier, you know, it's been 28 fucking years since I did Mantar, and people are still talking about me. And good, bad, or ugly, I don't care, but they're still talking about me. And whether it's the belly to belly suplex, whether it was the Mantar shuffle, whether it was just a fucking bullhead, I don't care. I'm just happy that I have fans out there that love me, adore me. And you know what? If I can make somebody's life better, um, just, just a little pinch. If I can just make their life just a little bit better um, during the course of the day or inspire them um, in any way, shape, or form, that's what it's all about. Because I'll tell you what, um, I worked hard in my life as a professional wrestler. I gave everything that I had to the job. I moved like a middleweight out there in the ring. I flew around like I was um, twinkle toes um, on Cinderella. And so I have done it all. I've done the squats. I've done the push-ups. I've let my blood, sweat, and tears out there in the ring to entertain your fans. And so I definitely appreciate all the love that you're giving back to me on a daily basis. I hear it every day. Um, people send me a text, Mantar. I love the Mantar gimmick. You were the man in the WWF. Well, you should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, you know what? WWE Hall of Fame doesn't really mean nothing to me because in my opinion, it's a fucking joke. You know, it's a who's who. And, you know, if you know this guy, you want to put him in, okay, we're going to put him in. You know, I mean, this last class, uh, who did they put in Sable, for fuck's sake? The fuck has she done? She was just one of the original fucking divas that looked good. That's all she did, you know. So, I mean, if they're going to put people like Sable in, you know, they've done absolutely nothing for the wrestling business. Um, it's a joke. It was a joke. I mean, I'm glad that, you know, Ray Mysterio got in this year. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy for a lot of people, but, you know, for, it's a lot of, you know, again, click, clicky friends putting their clicky friends in the Hall of Fame. Like, this is my buddy. I want him to go, you know, like, when you see the click, you see, the one, two, three kid was in there for the one, two, three kid. You see, he was in there for DX. Um, you see, Triple H was in, you know, Triple H, uh, Degeneration X, this one, that one. You know, and hey, man, in my opinion, it's, it's a friend's fucking Hall of Fame and not a true wrestling Hall of Fame. True. It, it's uh, it's interesting, like uh, who who gets in and, and who doesn't get into the whole thing. But yeah, I mean, how do they come up with that shit? I mean, you know, is there a fucking criteria that you got to meet, nope. or that you know you got to check certain things off your fucking list of your career? Got to be like a four time fucking champion, uh, whether it's tag team or individual. You know what the fuck is it? You know? I yeah, mean, there's no criteria. You know, yep. Yeah, you know, I mean, I can understand putting some of these celebrities in. You know, like Donald Trump and Cindy Lauper, and you know, I can understand you know some of them people because they had really entertaining matches when they were there, and people remember that shit, right? And so even though they you know they had a one off or two off or three off or whatever, they still made their mark. But you know, when you put people in like Sable who just looks good, just looks the part, that makes no sense. She didn't do nothing fucking uh, in professional wrestling that. Uh, she never had no wrestling skills, you know, so why should she be in a professional wrestling hall of fame because she looks like a nine and a half out of fucking ten? Give me a break. <laughs> fucking simply outstanding. Look how good I look, man. I deserve <laughs> a fucking spot in the hall of fame, for God's sake. 
I knew that. Right? You got a beautiful smile. I think yes. that's, that's full of petty fucking worthy. But I don't give a shit about the fucking Hall of Fame because, like I said, it's all of who's who and um, who's done it. And, you know, I mean, people that they put in post humorously, they should have put in when they were fucking alive, but they didn't because there was some bullshit fucking heat. And now you want to put them in now that they're fucking dead? Fuck that shit, man. You know, if, if you're not a friend to me when I'm alive, you're not going to talk to me when I'm alive or check on me when I'm alive. Don't show up at my fucking funeral to say goodbye. Because you have plenty of chances to come talk to me in fucking real life. All it takes is, you know, 10 fucking 20 seconds out of one person's day to send a text and say, hey, big man, what's going on? You know, but you want to show up when I'm fucking dead or make some big fucking spectacle? Do it now, man. Do it now when I'm alive. And, and you know, whether we got to be for... Whether we got to tell some funny stories about some experiences we had, whatever, man, let's just share together while we're here because, listen, well, all our tickets are numbered any fucking way, and it's not up to us how long we're here for. It's up to God. And, um, you know, I've already been dead on the table for 20 minutes, and so I know that I'm on ball time, and, and so I can't tell you how blessed I feel. I see the white light. I see the angels. I've been on heaven's gates, man. I've been there and done that already. And so I know that I got a spot in heaven. God gave me a chance to live or die. And I chose to live and he fucking made me start breathing again after they shocked me three fucking times and were giving me CPR for about 22 minutes. You know, so, I mean, I'm blessed, man. Every day I wake up, man, I just like, thank you, God, for opening up my eyes and let me, you know, put a stamp, trying to put a stamp on today's world, right? You know, I think this world would yep. be a lot better. It would be a lot better place if people would just be a little kinder to each other. You know, show some love and kindness and have compassion because, you know, you never know um, what someone else is going through, right? And um, just uh, just say, hey, man, how you doing? Just wanted you to know that I'm thinking about you and I hope you're doing fine. That could change somebody's whole fucking life around, man. They could be on death's door putting a pistol to their fucking head and they get your text and all of a sudden they throw that fucking pistol down. What the fuck am I doing, man? I'm still loved and I'm still wanted. So you never know somebody else's uh, uh, position in life. So you should always be kind. You should always edge on the kindness side and the love side. And if we spread more kindness and love, like you said, this world would be a lot, a lot better off than we are now. Totally agree. It's a, a great uh, way to end it, too. Great point, uh, Mantar. But thank you so much for all the time. I really appreciate it. Hey, John. It's been my pleasure, man. Um, I'm ha- really happy to be on the two-man power trip, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, John P. here. He's the man. And two-man power trip. And don't forget, SOB Sports Network on Monty and the Pharaoh platform. Check us out. We've got our own platform on YouTube. So we're just getting started. But, hey, you know, give us a helping hand and like, sh- like share, and subscribe. And um, appreciate it, man. All the love, man. Thanks, big John. It's been a pleasure.